أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ومن يتق الله يجعل له مخرجا ويرزقه من حيث لا يحتسب ومن يتوكل على الله فهو حسبه إن الله بالغ أمره قد جعل الله لكل شيء قدرة صلوات محمد وآل محمد My brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته So today, inshallah, I'd like to continue um, where we left off in the story of um, Prophet Musa's encounter with Khidr, alayhi, alayhi um, If you remember, yesterday we had gone through the story up until the point where Prophet Musa questions him, and Khidr says, now we'll have to part. And before he explains to him, um, the significance and the explanation behind all the strange things that he did. And we'd also concluded that people are born with a goodly fitra and that Prophet Musa had spoken out and um, retorted because of this fitra and that's why he could not keep quiet. And that every single person is born with that moral compass inside them and that the function of religion is to enhance channel and nurture that fitra, that natural goodliness, towards godliness, um, to make that individual God-centered or to make that society God-centered. So we'd left it there on a bit of a cliffhanger, and Prophet Musa was about to find out the significance and meaning behind the incidents. So I'll read it to you again. You've got it on the screen there. He said, this is where you and I part company. I will tell you the meaning of the things that you could not bear with patiently. The boat belonged to some needy people who made their living from the sea, and I damaged it because I knew that coming after them was a king who was seizing every serviceable boat by force. The young boy had parents who were believers, and so fearing that he would trouble them through tyranny and disbelief, we wished that their Lord should give them another child purer and more compassionate in his place. The wall belonged to two young orphans in the town, and there was buried treasure beneath it belonging to them. Their father had been a righteous man, so your Lord intended them to reach maturity, then dig up their treasure as a mercy from him, as a mercy from your Lord. I did not do these things of my own accord. These are the explanations for those things that you could not bear with patience. So firstly, Khidr salam, tells him that the people whose boat he damaged there were fishermen on the sea, but there were poor fishermen who had this one boat that they worked on for a living. And there was an evil king who was usurping all the boats in the region to add on to his naval fleet. So he damaged their boat so that the king would disregard it. Then later on, they could easily repair it. So in that moment, of course they must have been distressed and upset as to how their boat was damaged, etc. Only for that distress to turn into joy when they'd realize that they were actually saved. So, and they could continue with their fishing. So in this story, Allah explicitly shows us that he looks out for people who strive hard to make a living, for poor people who are good. They were generous in offering them a lift in, this, in their means of livelihood, and Allah protects that very thing for them. And of course, it would have been an awful thing to happen to them. Um, so what seems like a bala to begin with is actually a source of rahmah for them. And Khidr is the agent of that rahmah. Remember we said that he was, Allah introduced him as a servant to whom we've given a special rahmah. So here we see that rahmah being manifest. Now, in the second incident, Khidr explained that he killed this boy because both his parents were believers and he would have grown up to become tyrannical and oppressive. And he would have led those two righteous believers into disbelief and that Allah wished to grant them instead of him another child who would be kind and compassionate and help to preserve their faith. 
And a hadith from the A'imma, when you read the tafsir works, they say that that child that came after was a girl and that there were 70 prophets that came from her lineage. Um, this particular action of Khidr's, of killing a boy, um, the ulama say that's another proof for the, for the notion that he could have been a prophet and not just any ordinary human being or a saint or you know, a wise man and that he was a prophet because it, was, it would only be a prophet or somebody with revelation that could carry out an act like that, that could kill a boy without a retaliation or something. Um, so they use that as another piece of evidence in favor of the idea that he was a prophet. Now, the most traumatic thing that can happen to parents is the loss of a child. Um, the death of relatives, of friends, contemporaries, parents, all of that is to be expected. It happens, it's, it's a loss, but it's bearable. But f the loss of a child is something extremely tragic in a parent's life. For believers, however, for righteous people, when they've strived hard for a child, then to see that child become tyrannical or oppressive or do wrong in society, the idea that they'd be punished in the hereafter or that they're a menace to society would be an even greater tragedy for righteous believers, more than the, the physical loss of them. So here, it's, again, um, a manifestation of, Allah, of Allah's rahmah on them that this child is taken away from them. Now, people may argue about predestination. How is it fair if Allah takes away his life before he's had a chance to prove himself? And he may have ended up being good. But something like this, by command of Allah, is out of his certain knowledge. And it's out of him knowing. Allah says in the Quran, we've, you know, the disbelievers will say on the Day of Judgment, Rabbir ji'un. My Lord, send us back and we'll do good deeds. And Allah says they'll go back to the same, exactly the same thing if we were to send them back. So he knows that the good in his life up to that point has come to an end. And it's better to take, um, to take his life. Now, again, it's something to be remembered that life isn't something that's our right. It's a gift. It's, an, it's not something we're entitled to. It's a gift from Allah, and he can give it and take it as he wishes. It's in his command. So for him to have taken that life is a rahmah, because he saves him from a potential life of sin and tyranny. He saves his parents' his faith, because Mufassirin say that out of that extreme love for him, they could have inclined to disbelief in protecting him. The boy can't be punished in the hereafter because he hasn't actually done anything wrong. So even there, there's nothing, there's nothing bad for him. The parents' lineage is secured through their other child, and they still have good memories of this child. So all in all, this one seemingly negative action paved the way for a lot of rahmah to come into the world. And again, Khidr was the agent of that rahmah. Now, the first thing that Khidr says, if you notice, when he talks about the boy, he says, as for the boy, his parents were believers. And that's a very important thing here. It makes a huge impact. That, and Allah constantly says in the Quran, Allah's promise is true for the believers. It makes a difference when we're believers. Allah takes care of our affairs. Allah saves us from a lot, averts us from so much that we don't even know about. So they would have had to bear that grief and that loss and that pain. But with, followed by years of ease. So that's something that we have to focus on, the fact that Allah calls them believers. It's not just them saying we're believers. For Allah to label somebody as believers, that means they were believers by his definition of it. Right? They were believers by his standards of what believers are. And this is an important point that we have to bear in mind. It's all well and good at saying that we're being goodly and we're being godly and we're God conscious, but by whose definition? It's very easy for us to justify that we're being goodly because the, the means justifies the end or our intentions are good. But we've got to remember that it's, we're supposed to be mu'mineen by Allah's definition. So for Allah to call them mu'mineen, this is when his promise is true. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, 
أن يقول آمنا وهم لا يفتنون؟ Do people think that they'll just be left to say we believe and they won't be tried? So this is something to bear in mind. And what is his definition of believers? The Quran is replete with this. Sometimes, unfortunately, we get stuck in our rut of you know referring to the one or two books and the Risala Amaliya and that's it. You know, but if we open the Quran and see what's expected of us, Allah tells us who is a mu'min, who is a muttaqi, who is a muhsin, who is a salih. You know, who are these good doers? What does it mean in his by his standards to be a goodly individual? What does it mean by his standards to be a godly individual? I mean, just one example, if we look in Surah Mu'minun, entitled The Believers, right at the beginning, he gives a six-point checklist of what, what believers are. And he starts off by saying, قَدْ أَفْلَحَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ He's already promised that. The believers are successful. And he, then he goes on, who are the believers? He says, الَّذِينَ هُمْ فِي صَلَاتِهِمْ خَاشِعُونَ and This is going back to what Shaykh Ali Radha said the other day, that... What Allah talks about in the Quran, he says aqim salat etc. But the form is not really mentioned. But the khushu is the presence of the heart, the humbleness, that God-centeredness in the salah. So the first definition he gives for a believer is aladina hum fi salatihim khashi'un. Those who are humble in their prayers. Waladina hum anillahu mu'ridun. Those who turn away from friv- frivolous things, vain things, pointless things things that have no benefit, entertainment for the sake of entertainment. وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ لِلزَّكَاةِ فَاعِلُونَ Those who do zakat, so it's not just they give 2.5% of their wealth or give in charity, they do it. That means they're an embodiment of that charitableness. They give of themselves, they give of their money, they give of their time, they're, they radiate that charity in them. وَهُمْ لِفُرُوجِهِمْ حَافِظُونَ Those who are chaste and modest, they're aware of gender differences and they respect gender differences. وَهُمْ لِأَمَانَاتِهِمْ وَأَحْدِهِمْ رَاعُونَ Those who, are, who observe their oaths, their contracts, their transactions, they're very loyal in what they do. Their word bears honor and they're honest to the core. وَهُمْ عَلَىٰ صَلَوَاتِهِمْ يُحَافِظُونَ Again, they preserve their salah. It's something sacred to them, their salah. They guard it. I mean, this is just on a side note, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's definition of a mu'min. So, you know, for these people to be called believers and for Allah to look out for their faith and to preserve it once they make that commitment is very, very beautiful. And obviously Allah promises success in this world and the hereafter for those who strive on being believers. Then the last incident with the orphans, Khidr explained that their father used to be a good righteous man. Again, كان أبوهما صالحا Their father was a righteous man. So Allah wished for these orphans' his treasure to be kept, kept safe from these miserly villages. If they couldn't even offer hospitality or return people empty-handed, then of course they'd use up this treasure if they found it. And Allah would preserve it for them, <clears throat> would keep it for them for when they needed it most, when they came of age. And again, Allah says actually explicitly in the Quran, He says, He says, let those who fear for the future of their children for the future of their weak children. So if you fear that you're going to die young and you fear for the future of your own children, then be kind to orphans and be conscious of your duty to Allah and speak out for justice. So in order for, to secure your future, be kind to others. Be conscious of what you do and Allah will secure that for you. So this is, this is a given that Allah does these things for believers and for people who are good. So to recap, Yesterday, in Prophet Musa's act of questioning, we saw this innate godly fitra at play and how that universal morality works and how strong the voice of the fitra is. But here we see how Allah's hand works in the lives of those who consciously choose a God-centered life and nurture that fitra through their actions and pious practices. (coughs) And then the story just ends abruptly. Okay? Sorry, salwat. (coughs) 
Now there's, <coughs> sorry. Now there's a very interesting, sorry, salawat. <clears throat> okay, so an interesting observation has been made um, about what the learning outcome for Prophet Musa would have been here. And they've remarked that these particular events, these specific three events, could have actually been reflections of parallel incidents in Prophet Musa's life, okay? That he was either oblivious to, or that he'd forgotten, or that were shown to him to specifically highlight to him exactly how Allah's hand has worked in his life too, and how he's been an agent for Allah's mercy without even realizing it. So just as the boatsmen faced a threat of drowning, in order to be saved from an evil king, so had Musa himself once faced a threat of drowning, potential threat of drowning, in his little makeshift boat to save him from an evil king. To an onlooker, it would have seemed like a dreadful thing for his mother to be throwing him into the river to save him from that. But there's that parallel. Just as the killing of the boy was going to pave the way for much good and rahmah to come into the world, so was Prophet Musa salam's killing of the Egyptian, the spur and um, impetus for a lot of good things that came after that. The escalation of all the events that led up to the emancipation of the Bani Israel and the preservation of their faith, their preservation from tyranny and oppression, etc. So even though the killing was accidental, Prophet Musa had still been Allah's agent for that to come in. And just as the two orphans' property was secured by a man who was tired and hungry and needy and free of charge, so was two maidens' sheep watered by Musa himself, who was a fugitive, tired, needy, lost, hungry, and again, free of charge. And Musa's own future was secured in that moment too. And as, as he's, it's so beautiful, as he's finished helping these, these two girls water their sheep, and he's totally destitute. He's just come from the desert, fugitive, no shelter, no food, nothing, nothing to his name. And he walks into the shade and he says, Rabbi inni lima anzalta ilayya min khairin faqeer. He said, my Lord, I am totally, totally destitute. I'm faqeer, needy of anything you can throw my way, anything you can send down. I'm needy of. And within the space of a mere few hours, he's got himself a wife, Prophet Shu'ayb is his father-in-law, a secure job for eight to 10 years, a herd of sheep and a farm of his own, a shelter in the land of Midian, security from the Egyptians, and revelation to come after that. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, through that act, just as he secured the future of the orphans, he's done the same thing for Musa. And it's an interesting observation. Obviously, Allahu A'lam, Allah knows whether this is, you know, um, this is what his intention was. But what we need to draw and what we need to understand from this is that this is not limited to prophets. Allah takes charge of our affairs just like that, of anyone who consciously turns to him. When he says Prophet Yunus, alayhi salam, he says, فَأَنْجَيْنَاهُ مِنَ الْغَمِّ وَكَذَلِكَ نُنْجِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ we saved him from that, from that intense grief and sorrow. And that's exactly what we do for believers. So it's not something reserved for prophets. And this agency of, being, of bringing rahmah is not reserved for prophets. People have to commit to leading a God-conscious life, and he makes us that. Um, the ayah I recited at the beginning sums this up very beautifully. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَن يَتَّقِ اللَّهِ يَجْعَلْ لَهُ مَخْرَجًا Whoever is conscious of his duty to Allah, Allah makes a way out for him from every difficulty. وَيَرْزُقْهُ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا يَحْتَسِبْ And he provides for him from where he can not even imagine. وَمَن يَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَى اللَّهِ فَهُوَ حَسْبُهُ And whoever relies on Allah, then he's enough for him. إِنَّ اللَّهَ بَالِغُ أَمْرِ قَدْ جَعَلَ اللَّهُ لِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدْرًا Allah makes him fulfill his purpose. 
end, Allah has set a measure for everything. So it's for anyone who is God conscious. And how does he do this? How does me being khashia in my salah, or how does me being God-centered, or you know, how does that translate to um, the outside world where I'm, I'm an agent for rahmah, etc.? The way Allah does that is he puts opportunities in our path. He puts opportunity, maybe unintentionally, maybe we're not direct agents like Khidr was, but that's the best thing that, I mean, the, the most rahmah that Allah could have on us is by letting our life, our existence on this earth be a catalyst for goodness. That would be a life worth living where an individual or a community is a catalyst for goodness, is an agent for rahmah to be spread around them. That would be, that's, that's actually a purposeful existence. That's what godliness is. And Allah takes care of the rest. That's what being a khalifatullah is about. That's the whole point. To be here, to be God conscious in ourselves, and Allah puts the opportunities in our path to do good. Inshallah. Now, Khidr ends off by saying a very important thing. Like a little disclaimer before they part company. He says, وَمَا فَعَلْتُهُ an amri." He says, I did not do this of my own accord. I didn't do anything of my own accord. And it's a very important point here, that even though Khidr was an agent of Allah, any negative thing he does, he does not attribute to Allah. If you notice um, on the screen, the bits in purple, okay, the bits that are colored, he says, when he damaged the boat, he says, I damaged the boat. Even though it's by direct command of Allah, he didn't say, Allah made me damage the boat. Allah damaged the boat. No, he says, I damaged the boat. He said, I killed the boy. But he said, we wish that their Lord should give him a child, a better child. Their Lord intended that the orphans should reach maturity. So all positive he attributes to Allah, all negative to himself. And that's the adab of mu'mineen. That's the adab of good people, that they believe, they live the fact that in Allah's hands is only good. He never does injustice to his creatures. Prophet Adam salam, when he ate from the tree, he straight away admitted his mistake. But shaitan on the other hand said, Bima agwaitani. You led me astray. You made me fall. They, he, but as believers, we do not do that. Allah himself may call himself Al-Muntaqim, Al-Jabbar, Al-Qahar, the Conqueror, the Avenger, Al-Mumit. These are names that perhaps we'll never understand, let alone try and manifest and things like that. You know, what we have to understand is Biyadihil Khair. Allah does good and he doesn't, he's never unjust. So no one has the right to attribute wrong to Allah. No one has the right to say Allahu Akbar and cause bloodshed. How dare they say Allahu Akbar and behead? It's not, it's, it, it's a total oxymoron to strive for khilafa and cause bloodshed in the process. I think to myself, Allah, uh, the angels must be laughing at us, you know, on seeing that this is what the humans that they predicted would cause bloodshed when Allah said he's going to create a khalifa. It's totally the opposite of what we do in God's name. In God's name, by God's name is what is goodness that should be spread, not zulm. So even by direct command of Allah, Khidr refuses to do it in Allah's name because Allah commands only good. And that's why we must necessarily question any act of wrongdoing that's done in God's name. We must understand that on this purpose of being God-centered, goodly individuals and goodly societies and goodly communities, we cannot wrong people, especially not in his name. And it's actually um, very interesting that um, the last words, among the last words of Imam Hussein alayhi salam, that um, Imam Muhammad Baqir narrates, he says, um, he, he narrates, when Imam Ali ibn al Hussein meaning Imam Sajjad salam, approached death, he held me to his chest and said, my dear son, I advise you of a statement which my father gave me when approaching death that he received in turn from his father. Okay, so 
These are words of Imam Hussein imparted to Imam Sajjad when he was leaving, and Imam Sajjad in turn on his deathbed. He says, Ya Bunaya, Usika bima ausani bihi abi, hina hadarat hul wafat, wabima dakara anna abahu ausahu bihi, Ya Bunaya, Iyaka wa dhulmi, malla yajidu alayka nasaran illallah. This is so powerful. He says, My dear son, never commit a crime against a person who has no supporter apart from Allah. For that to be parting words, I think is extremely powerful. And so, so sad for us that the man who was a hujjatullah, who was a rahmatullah on this earth and an agent for so much mercy on this earth had to be killed so, so wrongly himself. Assalamu ala al Hussein wa ala Ali ibn al Hussein wa ala awlad al Hussein wa ala ashab al Hussein jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We have time for questions and answers. We have time for questions from either side. From the brother's side. Uh, I'm asking about the death of the child. It's quite uh, challenging, the, the idea, because as you say, predestination, the idea that <coughs> maybe the story seems reductive in that we do not have control. It's saying that we do not have control how we become. It's up to Allah. So this child had no choice of how he becomes. But not only that, what's more worrying is that maybe it says even if your parents, as you say, are fully believers, that has no effect on how you become as a child. So even if they were believers, they couldn't ma manage to take him onto the right path. I don't know, what, 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 what do you say about that? I mean, the, that whole thing goes back to the, you know, to when we were in Alam al Arwah and the Mithaq and, you know, that there were some, some, um, when we're in Alam al -Dhar, some people, when Allah presented the covenant, this is what we have in a hadith, that he commanded both groups of people, or both, you know, arwah, to um, approach the fire. And there were some who jumped in without question. Some um, awata'atan, ya Rab, you know, we, we hear and we believe and jumped in. And there were some who were reluctant, you know, and based on their mithaq based on what they chose is what, you know, so ultimately somewhere along the line we had a choice, you know, and that's what we're acting out. But again, to, set, to kind of assume in a simplistic way that people will turn out exactly as their, you know, according to their parents' efforts, there's so many different things at play. I mean, Prophet Nuh's son, a prophet's son, and in the end, Allah dissociates him from, from Prophet Nuh. He says, Laysa min ahlik, you know, he's not of you. He's not part of your family. He actually, you know, cuts him off in a sense. So, you know, did Prophet Nuh not try enough, hard enough? Did he not, you know, do his best? No, I, you know, I think parents, good believing righteous parents by default are gonna try their best. But it's not, those aren't the only factors that affect a child. And you know this whole predestination versus how much free will and etc. and what happened before we were born and mithaq and all that. I guess these are you know unsolved mysteries that we'll never fully understand, as you know, unless there's anyone else, inshallah, who wants to add anything, they're welcome to. But my knowledge on this is limited. All right, thank you. Assalamualaikum. Um, I understood what you said about um, Khizr, uh, say attributing all the things that were quote unquote bad to himself and all the good to Allah. But then that suggests that what he did was, um, in essence, bad. But it 
couldn't have been because it was in the greater picture good. Uh, I, I'm just wondering. So they weren't in essence bad. They were apparently so a, neg a negative action to the eyes. You know what what the senses perceive as bad is still bad. Then what the internal what it ended up being was good, but to an onlooker or on the surface level in the material world, it's still a negative action. So maybe it's not an evil action in its real sense, in the actual, in the work of what it is, but in the material, in the apparent, in the manifest, it's still a negative action. So killing is still a negative action, even though the consequence or the reason behind it was good, but on the surface of it, it's still negative, not positive. I don't know if that answers your question, inshallah. On the lay side. Um, just going back to the, the kind of first question, um, I have a bit of a comment. Um, I don't know, I, I always think of it as God knowing what you're going to do doesn't necessarily mean that he makes you do it. So this idea of God being all-knowing isn't necessarily kind of um, active in the sense that it's kind of a forceful um, inevitability. It's just that you might have, say, five paths in front of you and just and God knows which one of those paths you're going to take. Um, and I don't know, that's how I always think of this kind of apparent conflict between kind of the kind of inevitable, well, the, the outcome and, and God knowing that outcome and your, your ability to choose that outcome as well. Mm. Yeah, that's def definitely true, and it's a very, very, um, very wise observation. And I guess, I mean, to put it in a really simplistic example of a of a parent, as a parent, if I give my child five pounds and say, you know, go and spend it, I know exactly what he's going to spend it on, you know, but that doesn't mean I've made him spend it on that, you know. He's got a few choices that he could. I know as a parent exactly what he's going to spend it on, but... It so doesn't mean I've made him do that. Any questions from the other side? <coughs> Sorry. Um, thank you for the wonderful lecture. Okay. I learned a lot tonight. Um, I just had a, a bit of a question slash comment um, about the little boy that had to be killed and if God had destined for him to die, why couldn't God have just made him die rather than being killed? Isn't that something where um, Khadr's free will is going to come in and he is taking the decision to kill the child? Well, he, Even though it was by command of God. Yeah, but he's acting on command of God. So it's something that he's obeying Allah, you know. And first, obviously, only Allah knows what the purpose of each child is just yesterday actually I was reading this really very sad article about um, aborted babies who don't actually die during their abortion so that they're, they're actually still alive and they're brought into a hospital because they have a heartbeat and they're alive and they're viable they actually can that life can be saved but the doctors don't intervene because the parents wanted that baby dead and you think, to, you think to yourself, you know, that baby lives for barely three, four hours. But the nurses who wrote the article, that three, four hours of life and feeling that baby and seeing that aborted baby, that had a purpose because it made the nurses question abortion. It made the nurses write the article. It moved certain people and changed their minds about abortion. So that baby's life had a purpose, even if it wasn't a you know, a purposeful existence of good doing, etc., etc. But Allah knows what he brings, you know, and whose purpose is to do what. Maybe that boy had a lot of good in his life up until that point. Maybe he brought a lot of joy to his parents, you know, and amazing memories, but maybe his, the good in his life had ended up until that point, you know. So we can't, it's, it's not for us to say, that, well, he could have just not given him life then, you know. There's a really... Beautiful extract, actually, of Imam Zain Labidin that that reminds me of in Dua Makarim al Akhlaq. He says, "Wa um, amirni." Hang on, I've got it written somewhere. Um, it's 
He says, وَأَمِّرْنِي مَا كَانَ أُمْرِي بِذْلَةً فِي طَاعَتِكَ فَإِذَا كَانَ أُمْرِي مَرْتَعًا لِلشَّيْطَانِ فَاقْبِذْنِي إِلَيْكَ قَبْلَ أَنْ يَسْبِقَ مَقْتُكَ إِلَيْكَ إِلَيَّ أَوْ يَسْتَحْكِمَ غَضَبُكَ عَلَيْهِ And he says, let me live as long as my life is freely spent in your obedience. But if my life should become a playground for shaitan, then take me up to yourself. Before your disgust should overtake me or your wrath against me established. So he asks for that. He says, there's no, there's no point to my life if it's going to be a playground for shaitan. You know, just keep me alive as long as my life is good. So we don't know the purpose behind Allah, but we've got to remember that he only does good. Sorry, um, my point was that Khidr actually caused the death of somebody, even though it was by the Akkad of Allah. He actually caused the killing of somebody. So instead of going through that way where somebody oh has like that the will okay okay also killing somebody. yeah so here the what the mufassirin say is that it may not have been khidr may not have been culpable for that because you know he's he's an, he's acting on Allah's command and that the death may not have been witnessed as a killing so it must it might have been a fall it might have been an illness it might have been something they they argue as to whether the other people could even see khidr you know, because, you know, did they see him rebuild this wall? You know, there's no reaction from anybody else. There's no, you know. So maybe as an agent, only Musa could see him. And it, he died of natural causes. That the angel of death came and the boy died of natural causes. But that this is just the dimension that's shown to Prophet Musa. That Khidr was an agent. You know, that this is how Allah's will works when it comes to the causality behind things, but that actually, you know, the boy could have just become ill, had a fever, you know, drowned, whatever, and it wasn't actually a killing or murder as such. Does that make, yeah, sorry, I didn't understand your question. Um, let me ask a question. Thank, thank you very much for the talk. Um, coming from the other perspective, there, on the assumption, obviously, that, that um, the boy was going to do some bad things in the future. It's seen as a mercy that he was killed early on. That guy's lucky. Why does he get to get killed and not other people who, have, who end up murdering millions of people? <laughs> lucky guy. I mean, so how does God choose his mercy? And how can we, I mean, do the Mufassirin look at the, the luck of the child? The luck of the child. Well, maybe because his parents are believers. You know, maybe that's got a lot to do with it. But Allah says many times in the Quran that he leaves the disbelievers as they are you know, to increase in their wrongdoing, for them to establish their, you know, and he gives them chances after chances after chances to repent, you know, and some of them do repent and some of them don't, you know, but he tests those whom he pleases. And so some of them are tests, some of them are respite, some of them are gradual baiting, as it's called, you know, so he's baiting them very gradually. And they just fall further and further into sin and become more and more confident with their actions. And some of them, maybe through the door of their parents, are lucky and, you know, are saved from that. Assalamu alaikum. Th thank you so much for such an enlightening lecture. What, um, uh, what I would like to learn this lesson, I've re I read the translation many times of the Kahaf, but what I've learned, important part, how you relate the Khiza story with the incidents happening in Musa's life, uh, when he's put into a river, and that is very, very interesting for me to learn. Another thing is, sometimes it, I question that, um, how can a prophet, relating to new son, that how can the, uh, the, the son of a prophet can be a disbeliever when your upbringing right from the beginning is according to your belief and your faith in God. And this sort of a question me many times that uh, how can, like in the case of believer parents, the son was like that. So how can it be? I know there's a question of free will and- uh, Yeah, that uh, comes into it. But um, especially in the case of the prophet Nu, where his son was disbeliever. So how can it be that it's a big question I always ask myself. See, in the, in the case of Prophet Nuh Islam, Allah actually tells him, take two of, of the animals and we'll save them and we'll save your family. He actually says that. And then when, when um, his son refuses to board the ark 
And Prophet Nur, he asks Allah, and he says, what about my son? You, Allah, you promised. And Allah says that he's not of you, he's not of your family, because his disbelief has gone to such an extent, you know? So there's, something's beyond a parent's control. You know, there's, you can't control how your grown-up child is going to be. You know, you, you can put however much, but ultimately everybody's, you know, everybody's free to, to, to act out their own, their own destinies. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells him that don't ask what you do not know. And straight away, Prophet Nuh retracts that. And he says, Rabbi, a'udhu bika an as'alaka ma laysa li bihi ilm. Oh Allah, I seek refuge in you that I should ask you something of which I have no knowledge. So even Prophet Nuh himself was baffled, you know, as to how his upbringing could have, could have led to that. But, you know, it's not only on parents' upbringing. There's so many other factors. There's f their friends, and there's the environment, and there's their own natural disposition, and there's, you know, what they watch on TV, and, you know, obviously not in Prophet Nuh's time, but, you know, there's so many other things, and... It's it's not just parents. Your you know, your father can be a prophet, and so we have examples like this. So we learn in the Quran. Any other questions from the sister side? Um, sorry, I, I have a question as well. Um, so in the case of, so you know, you you've talked about this, and Ali Reza, um, Dr. Ali Reza Burjani has talked about this as well, where you equate, equate sorry. Um, goodliness and godliness um, and I was just wondering whether the opposite is also true so for example when we talk about disbelief and kufr is it simply kind of lack of faith in the sense of uh, kind of a, a faith in one of the say monotheistic religions or is it something deeper and to do with this kind of badliness so to speak because to me it seems very harsh um, and obviously this is just an apparent observation that, you know, someone's disbelief means that they're, they're, they're subject to drowning, for example, or, um, you know, there, there are other cases where, where, where kind of disbelief equates to or, or leads to death. Um, and to me that seems very... Um, it seems a bit almost unfair, and I was wondering if there is something that's more than just a kind of non-belief in God is it something kind of worse than, well, I don't know if that's the, the right way of putting it, but is it, is it to do with the kind of, kind of an evil characteristic as opposed to just a, a lack of belief? Because there are a lot of people that are, so to speak, good people who just don't believe or are confused about belief. I think, I think it comes down to, I personally think it comes down to translation, actually. I think disbelief is, is a very loose, very vague, wishy-washy translation for kufr. The word kufr and kafara means to cover up the truth. So it's when you know the truth, you've understood the truth, and yet you rebel, and yet you cover it up, and yet you reject, and yet you deny and rile against it. I think it's a, you know, a much, uh, it's very specific in Arabic. It's not just a non-belief like you said. It's not just non-belief or a confusion or, a, you know, and often, you know, people have disbelieved their whole life and right at the end they believe, you know, or right, you know, they come to that eventually and they need to be given that time or they need to learn the hard way, you know. So I don't think it's, it's non-belief when Allah talks about kufr, you know, so there's a sense of covering up the truth when you've understood it. So you've, read, you've seen the truth in front of your eyes, you've had miracles sent to you, you've had proof sent to you, you've had guidance, and then you cover it up. You know, there's that. And there's also kufr, another, another meaning is ingrat ingratitude. So when someone's got that level of ungratefulness for the bounties that they have, for life, for, you know, for, their, for the air they breathe, that basic level of ungratefulness for what they have and they attribute it to themselves or attribute it to somebody else, you know, that very basic level of, um, of rejecting Allah or rejecting what, what they've been given, then that, that's the kind of disbelief. I think disbelief in English is, you know, not, that's actually non-belief. I think that makes sense. Unless any further questions, I think we'll end the salawat.